So, uh, yes, next um, we have Ozzy Sutherland from Netflix. Um, what? Hello, Ozzy. How are you doing? Do you want to drink a water before we go? Come on. Me? Uh, you, I, I, can have a, I can have a sip of uh, tea here. Some, some tea. I'll take yeah. a sip too, just for it. Um, so, hey, uh, Ozzy, uh, great to have you on here. And as I think I mentioned earlier, and I think everyone must be absolutely clear about that, um, Netflix has been a, a huge influence on really pushing for high quality, impactful and, and really amazing uh, content. So um, could you tell us a little bit about, about that? Yeah, um, I think if you switch to the next slide, it kind of explains our philosophy around some of this. So, you know, what is higher quality audio at Netflix? A lot of people ask us that question, including Will, and I've had many a uh, conversation and sit downs and even I see some people on this webinar I've spoken to before but we look at it as you know being captured on the day by highly qualified mixers and operators and industry-wide best practices now what does that actually mean like you know you're really capturing the audio on set as best as you can because there's a, a bit of a philosophy here to fix it in pre as much as you can so that they don't have to go and fix it in post the whole time which I know I think mixers are probably applauding that because they love hearing that, that it's fixed in pre so that they don't have to spend the time on the stage or anywhere else to fix it in post. And we say to mix in a Netflix size stage. Will touched on this a bit, you know, um, we've got it in feet and meters for everyone out there. But you know, for, for APAC, it's a nine meter by 12 meter by four meter size room. So it's like a large living room, we would say would be ideal to mix a Netflix show. Um, you try to premix as much in sound edit as possible. So if you're editing the show, you're premixing, getting pre-dubs correct, getting things out there, and you know you take the time to craft it um, ahead of time. We have a minimum of five one and two zero, oh, but where we can and whenever it's possible, depending on the title, we we want immersive audio as the top level master, and you know you can trim all the passes for the lower lower formats. And as I like to tell everybody out there, you got to remember that audio is 51% of the experience. And that's according to us, the sound guys out there. I think everybody will appreciate that. And that's, that's my, my big 51%. It's kind of my nickname even in Netflix now on my team. So <laughs> I, 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 I roll with it. Um, so that's, that's the, the gist of it. But why do we do this is the other question, you know, because as you all know, Netflix is worldwide. So you have Netflix in Japan, you have Netflix in, in Singapore, you have it all over in India, all over the world. And there's shows that are localized for all those regions. And so we have to optimize the, the viewer's audio experience for everyone. And that's particularly done if we try to capture it best on set. And then, like I said before, you're editing and mixing. So you're spending more time to craft the, as we like to say, the sonic continuity of the, the, the title. And we look to get a lot of feedback and it's a, a big feedback culture at Netflix where we talk to all of our vendors and hear what their feedback is on, on, on the specs and everything and whether they like it and how they want to use it. So it's essential to us to talk to everyone and, and we appreciate all that feedback. So don't ever be afraid to talk to us at all. This is a, a blog that was done in, in um, 2019, I believe. Um, it's about how we brought higher quality audio to Netflix and, uh, and, and, uh, and the story of it. And it started with a show that Will works on, um, but he wasn't on that season of it. It was Stranger Things. And I think um, you guys will be sharing out that link to this, uh, to this blog so people can read it and spend the time. But it's a great little um, testament on how it all happened at the studio and how we brought that higher quality sound out there to everyone. I think this is this is this question has come up multiple times now in in, in the chat is just really talking about um, dialogue and loudness and I know that the next few uh, slides touch on this this area um, so I'm really keen to hear um, allow you uh, Ozzy to share with everyone why you guys this is such a crucial part to yeah. what you require it it absolutely is. I mean, Will touched on it earlier. It's the number one problem, the dialogue problem. It's the number one customer audio complaint. I can't hear the dialogue. Dialogue is king. No matter what language or what show you're watching, you want to hear what they're talking about. It is the story. It drives the story. It sucks you in and brings you into the whole experience. 
So initially, you know, a customer will set the level according to what they're hearing on the dialogue, and then they change the volume as desired. So the previous spec, you know, that we had set the level according to an overall full mix. So that results in inconsistent dialogue, you know, all across the service. It's inconsistent for episodes within a series. It's inconsistent from title to title. So I think the next slide will actually show you a measurement um, that we've done. And you can see here, like episode five is measured at a different LUFS than episode 10's overall loudness here. So it, it can vary within a series depending on the storytelling and what's going on in the audio in that series. So that's a big thing. So you can go to the next one there. Um, what is dialogue gated measurement? We get this question a lot um, around the world. So it's basically dialogue intelligence. This has been around for a while, but we decided to go um, to this measurement, you know, about two years ago. And it's, you know, everyone's adjusting the volume according to what your audio audio audibility and intelligibility of the dialogue happening, you know, some everybody hears differently. But you set the dialogue at a fixed level and mix the other content around it. So that's like kind of what Will was explaining there too. And you're, you're measuring loudness only on the segments of program that actually contain the dialogue. So you, you can, I know Will said, I'm probably gonna get mad about this. I'm not mad. It's actually true. It's what we do at Netflix. It's like, you can be a bit more dynamic in your mix. But if you're too dynamic, you're gonna run into issues uh, in the long run. So it allows for consistent dialogue levels across the service. It makes it easier for the sound crew. So, you know, the room reference level gets to be the same for every title. And like he said on Stranger Things, they started at 82, they ended up at 83, and then they hit the spec the whole way for 10 episodes or eight episodes. You know, it was just not a problem. And I, I went over there during that time and they were cranking away like it was nothing. So there's no post-mix loudness correction needed if everything is hitting the spec. And, you know, one of the things Scott Kramer does, um, who's, you know, um, the manager of sound here on, on the CTI team, he's working closely with the EBU and ITU for all the global considerations around this. And the ideal thing is we want your remote to stay on a table or couch while you binge and do your thing and watch the show. We don't need you having to adjust it. Maybe you adjust it because the kids go to sleep or something, but that's about it. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. And I, I think, especially, you know, on a service like Netflix, the content is just such a wide variety of stuff. There has to be a way like this to make sure that there, there's some consistency between them. And obviously dialogue is so crucial to the things that we do that that makes a lot of sense to me. It's absolutely crucial. And, and you know, there's a lot of tools, and I think I, I talk about it here is, there's a lot of um, meters that support dialogue gated measurement, especially in your ecosystem there in the third third party ecosystem like NewGen, Isotope, Signum, Waves, they all have Netflix presets built in. You know, they've worked with uh, our teams over here to have the Netflix um, dialogue gated spec built into them and they actually can support and measure dialogue gated measurement, which is great that they're, the, the ecosystem is trying to make it more readily available for everyone out there. Exactly. Now, I think the next thing we uh, no, that actually, again, this question came up just talking about yes. um, references and, and listening levels in the room. So this is interesting as well. So as you as you heard Will speak about, you know, the the big dub stages, as you can see in this picture here, that's the the Cary Grant Theater at Sony in um at uh, you know in Culver City. It's one of the biggest dub stages in the world. That's a cinema reference level room so 85 db all day long what we recommend as much as possible is you're at tv reference level which is like will was speaking about 82 db and ideally 79 db but you as mixers it's up to you to kind of figure out where it's most comfortable so then you're working to be in spec and you know this is it's really an important thing to, to understand is that you know you can't just crank the room up and expect and you, you know, because you, over time and as you're mixing everything else, you'll, you'll fatigue yourself and, you know, things will end up in the wrong places. So it's very important to have your reference level correct as you start off on a, on a title. And if you're going to be doing eight to 10 episodes or anything like that, you want to keep that consistent as you go along. So that allows you to be able to check all the versions of it. You know, if you're doing Atmos or 5.1 or stereo, 
you've got to make sure you're ins ensuring the stereo quality of this because remember at the same time you're you know we're out there we're not dropping this in a theater like that size it's for people who are on their mobile device it's for people who are at home on a on a sound bar it's for people who are on the train watching it and then they end up at home and they put it back on their tv or their laptop and they're trying to you know finish off this this title um, so the, the main thing here is that, you know, the peaks can't exceed minus two um, dBFS. The loudness metering, you know, the EBU R128 standard is 23 LKFS program gated. The Netflix spec is minus 27 LKFS dialogue gated. So as we talk about like a dynamic range also for the loudness range, four is usually not dynamic when you're looking at it. 20 is very dynamic and 23 is like cinema level. So, you know, if you're at like, uh, you know, between nine and 18 on your dynamics range, you're probably in a good place for anything that's going to land on Netflix. But if, you're, if, you're, if your mix is very dynamic, that's okay. It'll probably be fine. But, you know, if you're up in that cinema range, things are going to, the QC side of it will, will be the first part to hit you and, and let you know that too. Okay. Um, now, moving on, um, yeah, I mean, there, there's a, quite a lot of information there, but I know that one of the things that Netflix has done an excellent job of all the way through is making sure that all the deliverable requirements and the specification guidelines that you guys have uh, are publicly available. Absolutely. Anyone can take this link, and I'm sure you guys are sharing this out on your socials and everywhere, and, and it's help.prodigal.com. Um, and you can get the Netflix mix sound specifications and best practices and also the, the home at most deliverable requirements. And they're out there for everyone to, to read and, and check out. Um, we have no problem sharing that. And it's a testament to our team, you know, and, and what we do. Um, this, this next thing, I, I love this Aussie. Um, there's a, there's a couple of shows out there that have just, um, amazing sort of statistics of, of how many different languages they support on launch. And this is something probably quite new until a service like Netflix comes along. So, you know, M&Es and, and localization, especially we're in APAC time today. Um, yeah. Thanks for staying up. It's hugely, hugely important. Yeah, no, this is a big one because, um, I mean, you know, studios dub in up to 40 languages, but you know, like a, a title like uh, Stranger Things, it's usually in about nine languages. But remember, when you're doing animation, and we do quite a bit of animation, you know, children can't read. So you dub in up to 37 languages or, or so, and you have to have that content available for them because they want to watch it and it, they need to be localized. So there's no secondary audio. And many viewers actually prefer the dubs in their language. So they really want to have that experience and hear it in their native Castilian or their in Japanese or in whatever whatever part of the world we're in, we want them to have the, the right experience. So it's really important, this whole music and effects and localization aspect. Um, and it's, it's kind of a, it's been a common thing around most, most studios here in, in the US and UK and, and in, in, in EMEA and stuff, but it's fairly new for APAC to, because you know, you're now taking your content and you're putting it on a global platform. And, that's the biggest thing. It's like your content is going to be seen everywhere in all the different countries across the world. So it's, uh, it's in your best interest to make sure that the M and E is budgeted correctly. And, and you take the time to, you know, editorial helps you with an M and E and, you know, you set aside time to check them because it's really important to be able to get it so they can do an English dub or a Spanish dub or whatever French dub of that show. And, and be able to deliver that in, in a timely fashion. So the next slide actually, um, I think also touches on this. So this is a link that will, I think it's after this, which we'll, we'll share out that explains to you how to make a, a music and effects mix for Netflix uh, or for, for anything basically. Um, and it shows you the basic signal flow of it, dialogue stem, flip stem, music stem, effects stem into some type of console or Pro Tools or however you're doing it. And then you get the M and E and a fully filled effects stem that goes out. So the next slide actually shows, here's a link to a YouTube video that Scott actually made to show you how to enable doing a better music and effects creation tutorial. And it's out there for all of you to watch. And if you have any questions, I mean, honestly, you can feel free to reach out to us 
and we can get you any information you need and on, on this and our dubbing teams are incredible at Netflix. So they're, they're happy to help out also when it comes to this. And it's, it's really important to get m and &E correct yeah, for, the, I, for the dubs. It, it's interesting, isn't it? I, I know working on, on television in, in New Zealand, when we worked on international product uh, projects, it was a requirement and it wasn't as easy to sort of get the knowledge and the background of how to do it. So having those guidelines and those tutorials really helps. So I think this is it. I mean, the whole, the whole topic has been about um, immersive audio Dolby Atmos moving into yeah. this next world of, of sound. But, um, you know, Netflix have been a massive adoptee uh, adopted this technology um, massively. And it'd be really interesting to know why, why you guys have done that. Um, so, you know, I like this slide. I, I made this slide personally. Um, it, it's big things have small beginnings, right? So it's like, that's a, our planet shot from our planet. And when you think about it, uh, I, I was there for the early days of, of Atmos and, and Will and I spent time on that. And, uh, you know, we saw what the tools were and we saw where it was going. And I remember the first time I actually heard it, I was like, whoa, what is this? What is going on here? This is crazy. Um, but at Netflix, you know, we've definitely adopted um, the, the, the amount of Dolby Atmos titles are really growing. And uh, I think if you can switch to the next slide here, you kind of can see if you actually go into your Netflix, you know, if you go into the, the actual Netflix experience here and go and search just Dolby Atmos, you'll see a bunch of titles that will show up. And these are what are out there, films, you know, um, documentaries, all different formats are mixed and done in Dolby Atmos. And then they usually are also in Dolby Vision too. So we are trying to give the highest quality uh, experience to our viewers in that they can have, you know, a lot of TVs, LG, Sony, everybody out there have Dolby Vision, they're en enabled for Dolby Vision. They can also do Dolby Atmos over ARC to whatever, you know, soundbar or system that people are using at home. So the titles are, are definitely growing. It's, a, it's a, a, an experience, basically. We're trying to bring the, a, a cinematic experience for everyone at home to all of our viewers and let them experience something that totally immerses them into whatever title they're experiencing and, and, you know, at, at any given time. So I, I think, where, 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 where do you think this lands up? I, I think earlier on, excuse me <laughs> we heard from christine that she she thought as well you know this eventually ends up in the hands of of everyone where, where do you think the future lies uh I, I won't go as crazy on the future as 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 you would think um i mean i think the future is bright um and you know i think the future is is going to be the, i mean there's a lot of a lot of technology out there and a lot of great stuff happening in this space and you know immersive is, is here to stay because everybody wants to be immersed into whether they're on their phone, whether they're on their TV at home, whether they're on their laptop, they're sucked in and they want to finish this, this show and watch it and be immersed into the whole thing. And, you know, given even the, the whole pandemic times that we're into, everybody's at home, you know, multiple people are on different devices in different parts of the house trying to get an experience and watch something. I think the, the, the future is, is, is bright for it. And I, I think it's gonna be a well-adopted technology across the way. And, and you know, for, for a, a deliverable too, Atmos is a great piece. It's just like Dolby Vision, you know, we're able to keep everything together within the Dolby Vision delivery specs. And the same thing would lie for Atmos too, for the future to keep it as a great container for uh, delivering the files. I think that's one thing Will's always come back to is, you're keeping like a very high res version of, exactly. of, of the audio in its separate parts to be used however you need to. Exactly. That's totally it. So I, I think it's going to be uh, a great future and you know, we, we, we are definitely here for everyone. And I think the, I think the next slide mm -hmm. here that I wanted to touch on quickly was we are all about having open content out there for anybody to use. So we worked on a, uh, a little anime short based out of Japan with a production IG. Uh, Haruka 
from our team out there started this project. And then I came in after and said, we got to get Will to add some sound to this project. And we have an open content.netflix.com. You can go there right now and you can download all these little titles that you see here, including Soul Levante, it's entire Pro Tools Atmos session, the entire Atmos master files, the actual picture files are available there for it. And you can play with it and you can use it on your systems and see exactly what was done. You can see exactly how Will mixed it and how all the automation is there available and all his busing, his, his, his uh, multiband limiting, his limiters are all inside of the session readily available. So this is something we, we really like to do over here and, and we wanna open up the industry as much as possible and allow people to play with it. And it's been a great thing to actually hear from people in other parts of the world from Africa to, to you know, um, Asia to, to Latin America, people have reached out to us saying thank you for sharing these projects. They would have never had the opportunity to open up somebody's Atmos files along with all these other files and be able to play with them and use them. And we're, we're all about sharing this content with anyone. And, and I, I welcome anyone to just go out there and grab this and yeah. do that. And oh, especially yeah. anyone who's going to be working on an upcoming Netflix project that is going to be done in Atmos. It's a, it's a great starting point. Absolutely. Um, there, now there's um, several questions, about, but they're quite technical in nature. Well, I say t quite technical, mostly about um, loudness and those kind of uh, questions. Now you guys have great resources that are available. And as you said, the team at Netflix is open, absolutely open to being reached out to. Uh, as are we at Avid to try and help you uh, however you can. So there is some questions there that are primarily um, about uh, specifications. Mm -hmm. um, the yeah. Catherine's got a question down here. Thanks so much. No, thank you for watching. Uh, what uh, the open source, what is the minimum specs for Pro Tools? Now, this is a good question. The mix session is 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 fairly intensive, but you can have a look at the master session and even a relatively uh, modest system should be able to play the, the master session back. The mix session, you do need a, a fairly um, significantly powered uh, Pro Tools machine that you would be using for a larger mix. Um, but the, the, you can just perhaps try importing parts of those sessions. You don't have to import it all. Perhaps uh, use the session import data, just bring in some of it and, and have a look at how it's been set up um, there, uh, Catherine. So I wanted to touch helpful. on one thing. Yeah, yeah. sure, Sorry. of course. Please. If you can go back to that last slide, any questions that anyone has in, in, in the region for us, please reach out to that Netflix um, email link and send over your questions and we will find the time to um, get to them and answer them. And any, any questions that we may have missed here, feel free. And um, I'm sure they'll share this after also. Yes, exactly. Um, so um, I think that is, we are at time for us today. Hopefully this has been informative and helpful. And as I say, as a member of um, the AVID staff working in the APAC region, I'm really, really happy that we were able to do something during our, our time. Um, so often we're watching replays, but today we've been able to do it live in, in APAC and we hope to do more in the future. I thank um, Ozzy, Matt, uh, Christine, and of course, Will for joining us today, as well as Greg. Um, uh, thank you so much for your time. And this session will be available uh, in the future again for replay. And so I thank, thank everyone for joining. Thank you for your questions and look forward to seeing you all again on the next event. So uh, thanks very much everyone for your time and thanks to all the guests.